All right, everybody, welcome on back here to Simple Faith Baptist Church, where the Bible changes us. We do not change the Bible. Brother Carlos here coming to you live once again for another wonderful Wednesday evening of some good old fellowship, good old Bible teaching and preaching to hopefully edify your faith in God's Word, the Bible. I want to thank God for those of you that are physically joining us here this evening. And I want to thank God for those of you that are joining us virtually online. Truly do appreciate your faithfulness to want to hear the scriptures taught by us here this evening. You could be doing anything anything else, uh, but you decided to give the Lord your attention for the next uh, hour or so. And that's a blessing. And uh, just know that's what we want to do is we just want to give God the glory and uh, read the scriptures together to grow together as a family in Christ. Amen. So with that said, we are located here at 1836 Dixie Street, Oceanside, California. We currently rent from the Friendly Church of God in Christ. You can look for our <clears throat> parking signs out there in the parking lot to direct you to the space that we rent. Our current schedule, Sunday, Sunday school at 1 o'clock p.m., 30-minute class. Please join us. Sunday service, 1.45 to about 3. Please join us. Wednesday night tonight, midweek Bible study fellowship. And then Friday night discipleship class, 7 o'clock. Those are all opportunities that you can take advantage of to join us here in-house, get to know us. So we're going to go ahead and click on this prayer tab. Uh, the most important announcement that we have this evening is prayer requests. Please do me a favor and submit a prayer request online. Uh, I'm not sure uh, who this was, but uh, we do get prayer requests sent to our emails and so on. Uh, I do want to encourage the saints to keep this person in prayer I don't know who it is. It's a general name. The name that I received in the email is Bindu. Bindu, last name P. And the, and the email says this. Husband has been drinking, chain smoker, quarrels in the house. Daughter has whole pain all over. Father shouting and quarrels daily. The neighbors and other people are ashamed for his nature. Uh, evil eyes, devils, witchcraft, other people, including neighbors' eyes for this house and property. Uh, I think they're foreign, and I think they're trying their best to translate in English. So I'm just paraphrasing it so you can understand the message here in the email. Uh, can't live happily with the husband. Uh, he wants these these ornaments uh, that her father has given her, and it's breaking her heart. And daughter and her are suffering for the father's sake, and uh, the daughter has been contemplating suicide. So keep this person in prayer. God knows who they are, even though I don't, and people are contacting us from around the world I don't know who they are, but God knows, and God knows if they're sincere or not. So whoever that is, we're going to be praying for you. Please know we're praying for you, and I hope that you can get some help immediately. Separate yourself from that husband and take your daughter out of that harm's way as best you can in a legal and spiritual safe way. All right, so any other prayer requests, please submit them there. We want to pray with you and pray for you. Again, our Saturday night soul winning outreach, that's how you can get connected with us, 2 o'clock p.m. We meet here at the church house. We go downtown Oceanside to go street preach the gospel. I do want to give some cool shout-outs for some new signs we just got. Praise the Lord. And uh, this here is my new one, my new favorite one. I'll show you online. It says here, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. How about that? That you may know that you have eternal life. So that's my new favorite scripture signs. We have plenty more to go. We have plenty for everybody to have one to help us to win souls to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> okay, so with that said, other than that, our current live stream uh, we have here on the Facebook church page and our YouTube. We highly encourage you to check that out. Bible study resources and tabs. We like to also make shout outs for other great Christian Bible-based ministries that help Christians learn the book and also how to rightly divide it and understand church history. And so these are great ministries that we like to shout out for. And uh, last but not least, if you would like to give a love offering here to Simple Faith Baptist, you can do so online. Our normal giving is on Sundays. So once again, thank God for those of you that are here with us. Let's go ahead and get right into it. If you would, please turn your Bible with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 18. Acts, chapter number 18. And it's a little saddening that we start uh, this week here. We're missing an amazing family for those of you who know, the Kedleys have officially moved. Brother Quamain is now up there in 29 Palms, uh, and his wife and children are back home in Detroit. So please keep them in prayer. We surely are going to miss them. 
And it was a joy hearing little baby Christian run around here. So we love you and we're praying for you. Just know we're, we're definitely going to be bummed out without you guys here, but that's okay. We got the rest of our saints here that still need some loving and some preaching. And every once in a while, a belt for a brother. I ain't going to point any fingers. No, I'm just kidding. He knows what we're talking about. All right, so with that said, the book of Acts, chapter number 18. Uh, please do me a favor, and let's go ahead and start from verse number 1. Let's read back together just to remind ourselves of some context, and then we'll continue to do our best to go through verse by verse to help us understand the history of the church. And as we approach this book through a historical perspective, I hope that we can continue to learn together what has taken place at the birth of the church and the great man that God used, the apostles, uh, for the furtherance of his name. Verse number 1. <clears throat> After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. We talked about that in our past uh, broadcast. Feel free to go back there and uh, re-listen to the sermon. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. That's pretty cool. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now, we don't know for sure. The scriptures are not explicit in detail, so this is just my perspective. You can do your own research from history books, however you want to do it, as to the conversion of Aquila and Priscilla. I'd just like to safely guesstimate that they were faithful Jews that went to synagogue and they heard Paul preach and perhaps they got saved. We just don't know the exact detail, uh, but at some point we know they got saved. Uh, they ended up uh, accompanying uh, Paul in his journeys as we're gonna find out this evening. And when they opposed themselves, that is the Jews, in the synagogue in Corinth and blasphemed, he, talking about Paul, shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. For men's forth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house, was, uh, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. That's important. We'll talk about that. When Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Galileo cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. Father, we thank you for the word this evening. I pray, God, that you would help me to have a clarity of mind to approach the scriptures, to, to soundly teach what's before us. Help us all to gain an understanding, Lord, of your word, so we can be that much more knowledgeable in the history of the church, and so we can understand how you operated through apostles, just like Paul, and raised up men, just like we're going to see later, Crispus, Gaius, Priscilla, Aquila. And help us to gain examples, Lord, we can find them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, do me a favor. Let's go back here to verse number 9 through 10. I want to talk to you quickly about the believer's order of conversion. The believer's order of conversion. What do I mean by that in a long story short is that there is an order of conversion as it pertains to the steps one takes after he or, he or she becomes a born-again Christian. So what does that mean? Somebody tells you about Jesus Christ, wherever you are on the earth, and by whomever tells you, and you respond to the gospel. You ask the person who presents to you the gospel, how can I be saved? And they tell you, 
ask Jesus Christ to save you. Invite him into your heart, and you do. All right, so now I became a Christian, Manny. I became a Christian, Katie. I became a Christian, Carlos. What do I do next? Well, according to the book, you don't just stand there looking like awe into the heavens and say, well, I'll see you next time. <laughs> you get baptized. You get baptized. Look at here in verse number 8. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed, comma, and were baptized. That's why I say the order of conversion. And this goes all the way back to Acts chapter 8. Feel free to turn your Bible there with me. For this is what we see the, the historical principle of the order of conversion for people. Now the reason I say the historical principle is because ironically, you don't get a specific, I detailed, uh, I guess you could say a standard of procedure, if you will, SOP of how does one get baptized. But this is why we go to the book, the history book here in Acts, and see how did it occur. We know that at some point people that hear the gospel and respond, they, they must follow Jesus Christ as the Lord and obey his command to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's going to be by water immersion. But the question that is going to be posed is to when? Do we do it before response to the gospel and faith? After response to the gospel and faith? And that's why we go to the book of history here, the book of Acts, to tell us, can we see some examples? So go back down with me to Acts chapter number 8. And then we'll talk a, a quick a summary nugget as to this story between an African man who ends up getting saved by trusting the gospel of Jesus Christ through the preaching of Philip, the evangelist, as he was reading the Old Testament. So verse number 35 in Acts 8, and again, I'm reading out of the King James Bible. Some of you say, Brother Carlos, really? Do you really care to keep harking on that? I, hon I honestly don't really mention this whole issue a lot. Many of you guys know when I preach and teach, I don't really harp on the King James Bible issue as much as my fellow brethren do because I want to focus on the book. But if you don't have a King James Bible, perhaps if you're reading with me in your NIV, your ESV, you're probably going to be missing some of these verses. And I, I, I just want to encourage you as your brother, you don't want any verses missing out of the Bible. That's why we stick to this good old King James Bible. Every word is preserved in this book. Now I'll keep reading. Verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So they were reading the book of Isaiah. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still. Some of you are like, Whoa, brother, you missed verse 37. Ah, oh, you're right. Because I have a King James Bible. I have God's word preserved in this book, and I have every verse that God inspired and preserved. Again, if you're reading with me out of your NIV or ESV or one of these modern plastic Lego swords as we like to mess around with, you're missing verse 37. And that's a vital verse for you to understand the order of conversion. Here's what he says. When I say he, here's what the Holy Spirit says. Verse 37. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. But what was Philip responding to? The question posed by the Ethiopian man in verse 36, what doth hinder me to be baptized? What do I need to do first, Philip? What do I need to do to be baptized in that water? Now you've got to remember, this fellow just came down from Jerusalem. And of course, there are over 3,000 Jews that just left Judaism and whatever other belief system they may have had responding to Peter's preaching. They got saved. So water baptism is something known by many, many of course, John the Baptist out there preaching the Jews to get baptized. Water baptism was a, prom was a practice common amongst the people of this day as much as it is today. So this fellow says, what, how can I be baptized now? And unto your, whatever you're, you're sharing with me here, the, the, the scripture. Remember, he presented to him Jesus Christ from Isaiah. Verse 36, here's water. What hinders me? He already in his mind if you will, the scriptures give us a little bit of an insight into his mind. He understood now. I believe I want to get baptized just like I see other folks. I'm just, I'm just trying my best here. Verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. So what's the order of conversion? Somebody hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection. 
They cognitively and sincerely with all their heart believe in him. After they profess salvation, we say they get saved, praise God, then they get baptized. And he answered and said, this is the Ethiopian man, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what's going to save a soul today. That's what will save your soul if you're listening to me online. And if you're not a born-again Christian, how can you be saved from going to an eternal hell and an eternal lake of fire? How can you avoid paying the penalty for your sin, which is eternal separation from God in punishment and torment? If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, with all your heart, you'll be saved. And then you can get baptized. Now look at what Philip says. He commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. There it is. So the order of conversion, once again, you hear the gospel, you trust the gospel, then you respond by believer's baptism. So let's go back to Acts chapter 18. I just wanted to plug that in there. Some of you folks may not understand why that's important. I'll tell you why. Because there are a lot of other religious groups out there who practice the opposite. The Roman Catholic Church or the Greek Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church, any orthodoxy or any other religious cult that wants to baptize babies, they want to baptize little children who cognitively don't understand the gospel. They do it in a way to sanctify them. That is, they're, they're just trying to cover their butts, if you will. <laughs> in case something happens, you're baptized. And number two, people trusting religious teachings, not the book, not the Bible, think they're saved because they've been baptized. We hear that all the time. You can ask Brother Manny, myself. We go down there Saturdays to go win souls, and everybody more or less that we talk to says, I'm good, I've been baptized. But then we knock them with some scripture. It's not a works. It's by faith given by the grace of God for you to believe. And so we have to reteach people out of what they've been taught. It's kind of ironic, isn't that? We got to teach them out of what they've been taught so that way they could honestly be saved. So that's why the biblical order of conversion is important to understand. You hear the gospel first. You respond with all your heart, trusting Christ. Then believer's baptism succeeds that. Okay? Now let's go down to verse number 9 through 10 once again. <clears throat> Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid. Now, 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 now that's pretty powerful there. Now we don't see it there, but Paul was afraid. Of what? I'm not sure. He was a man of like passions. Remember when he was witnessing to the Lyconians, We are a man of like passions. <laughs> he had a heart just like you. He had a mind just like you. He at times would be bold for Jesus and at times would be saddened and a little heartbroken a little fearful for what's about to take place. This man has already gone through a lot in life, but here's the Lord, here's the Almighty, reaffirming what he said he would do with him and through him. Don't be afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. Now look at that. He spoke to him in the night by a vision. Now, once again, when we read the book of Acts, we approach it through the historical perspective because this is the Lord Jesus Christ initially using these men who have yet been inspired by the Spirit to write New Testament doctrine for the Corinths, for the Romans, Galatians, later on by John. So the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll see him at times appearing to these men supernaturally, like in a vision at night or in person, or an angelic ambassador will go forth to confirm a thing. And that's important for the establishment of their ministry. But once the scriptures are fulfilled, and once we have the rest of the canon, the Lord Jesus Christ will speak through the Holy Spirit by the word that he's given us. So just because you see it happening there, it's not necessarily taking place today. And that's what we believe, and that's a big problem why a lot of folks around the world are being fooled, especially by these African fools out there. I purposefully say Africa because I just saw a stupid video the other day of a uh, supposed some prophet out there with, a, uh, with uh, hundreds of folks in different tents wailing and falling all over the place, whopping all over the place, barking up a storm and supposedly manifesting a whirlwind uh, and talking about, I see the Holy Spirit, I see him. <laughs> Nobody ever saw him in the scriptures. 
So there's two things that are true of that statement. One, you're right, the Bible's wrong, or B, the Bible is right and you're wrong. Who's gonna judge me at the last day? Jesus. So what am I gonna trust? The Bible. Anything you don't see in this book is not of God. I don't care how fancy they dress, ironically, in Africa or Mexico. I don't care how their speech is persuasive. Romans 16 warned you about people with fair speeches. Better watch out for them, fellas, or gals, sadly to say. Whenever you see the Lord Jesus Christ perform a, a, a supernatural manifestation like this, it was for a purpose, and it was for a reason to establish the apostles' ministry. These men had, no, what, what did they have to go off of at this time? They had to go off of faith of the resurrected Savior, and at times when they would get uh, down in the dumps, if you will, for lack of better terms, the Lord would reaffirm something for them to understand, hey, keep going, I'm still here with you, and so on and so forth. Now, why is that important? Because here we have the Lord's affirmation for the work of ministry that he has called Paul unto. Let's go to Acts chapter 26 to give you guys some further scripture to understand what I'm talking about here this evening to do my best to bring this uh, principle of scripture with scripture. Acts chapter 26, and we're going to start here in verse number 15. Here we have Paul the Apostle recounting his conversion story. And he does it three times in the book of Acts. But every time after the book of, after chapter 9, you get a little bit more detail that you didn't get earlier. So here we get the full grand details of that account that took place there in Acts 9. And so here he is rehearsing it for us, verse 15. This is Paul speaking of himself. And I said, who art thou, Lord? Are you God? In other words, and he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness of both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which, are you ready now? I will appear unto thee. Hmm, there you go. That's why I tell you my explanation of those things when you see Jesus appearing to Paul in a dream by night, or an angelic ambassador and the boat, for example, later on, you're going to read in Acts 27, I believe, as they're sailing to Rome. The Lord did that for Paul. Because that's what he said he would do. I will appear unto you for where I'm going to send you. You understand so far what we're talking about here this evening? Verse 17, Jesus continues, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So the apostles' ministry were specific to them. They were unlike any general believer of today. That is, we don't have a special dispensation of ministry to go to somewhere and Christ himself is appearing to us in nights and visions. We are going to get stoned because we have to bear his name before the Gentiles and the Jews. That's not happening for every believer today. We are called to go forth into the world. You already have the book. Whatever happens, happens. You have Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. You, By faith, you approach it. But you already have all the truth. These fellows needed to be revealed truth over time, progressively. So just what Jesus said, I'm going to deliver you from the people. I'm going to appear unto you, unto whom I send you. So this is Jesus personally working with them for these purposes. Are you with me? Go to verse 18. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they, that is to whomever responds to their message, right? The, the people who hear may receive forgiveness of sins, inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Notice. What is the primary goal, if you will, the primary mission statement of Jesus Christ by sending out his apostles into the world? I see it here in verse 18. To open their eyes. Paul's responsibility, Peter's responsibility, James, John, all those fellas, their primary responsibility was to go reach sinners and to open their eyes. From what? Darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God. Jesus said, they are under the power of the devil. I am sending you to go open their eyes and to free them from that power if they respond to me in faith. You see, right now, the Bible says, that 
It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. In the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16, the gospel. When folks tell me or they tell you about devil oppression or devil possession or you've heard those things before and all these supernatural phenomena, I'm telling you right now. Jesus said, faith in me will in return set them free from the power of Satan unto God. Are you with me? I believe that the gospel has the power that is sufficient to make anybody free from the devil's grip. Whether it's willful submission or not. You say, what do you mean by that, brother? You're going to read of accounts of certain possessions take place. I understand that. But you see, none of us were there 2,000 years ago to actually get a visual of what it actually looked like. All we see is the letters in our English understanding here to explain to us what took place You'll read of a spirit of, of a lunatic and a, and a child. You'll read of a legion and a fella. And now we had the power to, to break chains when they would put them on him by trying to bound him right there in the, in the he was in the caves, etc. But none of us actually have ever seen physically or, or were there in person to actually see what it looked like. Today, I believe that many, many are so deceived by looking at the Hollywood scene or the YouTube or the online videos that are edited passed along, shared, of what men and their fanciful and fleshly sensations interpret the, the scriptures in order to gain a following for popularity. You say, what do you mean by that? There are so many of these ridiculous videos. Ironically, in other countries, not really here in the United States, you'll get some in the Pentecostal churches, but you'll hear these people screaming and hollering and and you actually see the supposed false prophets having conversations with these supposed devils. What is your name? What do you do? I mean, they're having a full-on, like, regular conversation. You don't see that in the book. If those people that attend those churches respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ by the authority that's been established in heaven between God, men, and the principalities and powers, they will be free from the power of darkness immediately. You don't have to wait. You don't have to go to some little sensational altar and say, am I really? Anoint me with oil, brother. Please pray for me because I need to get healed. Trust the gospel. You'll be healed. That's what he said. And that's what he told Paul. I'm going to send you out to go do. Peter, I'm going to go send you out to go. I'm going to go send you guys out there to tell the world they can turn from it. And if they put their faith in me, Here's what I'll do for them. Keep reading, verse 18. I'll forgive them all their sins. I'll give them an inheritance. They'll be sanctified. Are you ready? All by faith that is in me. It's not the works approach. It's not the works thereafter. It's by faith in him that he will do what he said he'll do for you. So when you heard the gospel and you responded in faith, you know what Jesus did? He saved you, forgave you of all your sins, gave you an inheritance. He sanctified you. You were immediately freed from the power of Satan. You were immediately freed from that power of darkness because he took you from that. That's what he said. Moving forward, our life thereafter, it's all a matter of our choice. If we choose to respond back to the darkness of this world, that's our fault. It's not his, but that's another preaching message. You're going to get that Sunday. But what has the Lord said there? He said, in the which I will appear unto thee. So who did he appear unto in Acts 18? To Paul. Jesus kept his word. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. Let's go down here to verse number 16 through 17. I just want to show you. Now, this is a whole different context here more or less by the end of Paul's ministry. Perhaps I could say geographically in Rome, I'm not sure. But at some point, a lot of Christians forsook Paul in his ministry. At some point. Look at verse 16. The Word of God says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 16, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me 
that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Wow, what a powerful statement. That a man who spoke with Jesus saw Jesus and when he was down in the dumps, persecuted, perplexed on every side, didn't want to live anymore, Jesus came to him at night and said, Paul, don't be afraid. I'm with you, but speak. What did he tell him to do? Preach. Tell him about me. Tell him what I can do. But notice, go back to verse 17, that by me. God is using people to save other people. That's a biblical truth. Yes, the Holy Ghost is more than capable of supernaturally Divinely opening up the clouds of heaven. He can cause any miracle he wants that's in accord with scripture. He can do anything outside of your little piece of dirt, redeemed flesh. He could do anything. But you know what? God chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He saved you so he could use you to save others. You are a vessel through whom God is using to save people. I had to come to grips with that biblical statement when folks would say, I led somebody to the Lord, I led somebody to the Lord. I, I, at the first, in my little immature Christianity, I used to think, oh, how, how proud are you to say as if you assisted God? But when I started to be humbled by knowing what the scriptures say now, whew, that's a blessing statement for you to say. Man, you helped somebody get saved. The Lord used me. I got saved and I administered the truth of that salvation by my mouth, by my lips, and somebody responded. You effectively saved them because you were a faithful messenger. We're ambassadors for Christ, the Bible says. We are ministers of reconciliation. We're going out there in the world saying, be reconciled. You are the vessel by whom God is using to save people. So praise God. Be used of God, amen. Don't be all shy like, oh yeah, it's all God through you and through me. Praise the Lord, that's a blessing. So what am I reaffirming? That Jesus kept his word. He kept his word for Paul. Let's go back to Acts 18. Verse number 11. And he continued there a year and six months teaching how to perform miracles among them. Is that what your Bible says? Let me try that again. Teaching how to prophesy words of knowledge for people's lives among them. Is, is that what your Bible says? Teaching the word of God among them. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I like that example. I know a lot of people. You know what they have? Different Christian ministries. You know what I see on TV? They have a supposed school of prophecy. A school of healing. A school where you can uh, operate in the divine that God has given you. Amen. What do you got to do though? You got to sow a seed. <laughs> you got to pay for them classes, boy, to learn how to be used of God, you know. Mm -mm. Paul, what were you sent to do? Preach. About who? Jesus. That's what his mission was. If God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, performed miracles and signs and wonders for people, it was to lead them to saving faith in Christ and to learn about him thereafter. It wasn't to just keep them clinging on to the act of the supernatural. It was to bring them to Christ and to learn from him thereafter. <laughs> I can't believe how so many of these false ministers today are using that show for self-glory, vanity, filthy lucre. My God, are they going to be in it for Judgment Day. Whew. Teaching the word of God among them for how long? A year and six months. That's what Paul did in Corinth. Long time for people to get to know about Bible. Now when Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Let's learn a little bit of history. Many of you guys know we like to do this. Praise God for technology. I'm going to show you guys here a little bit about Galileo. Pay attention to this um, Bible screen here. <clears throat> I'm going to show you from uh, a couple of our, our online dictionaries here from the Sword Searcher Bible Study software. 
Now, what's cool about that is, that, again, I like when the Holy Spirit will give people an understanding of what was taking place in the secular world at the time when certain things were taking place. For example, Herod, or you go back to the Old Testament, you always see a prophet at chance will say, you know, while this king was reigning, etc., etc. So here we have Junius Aeneas Gellio. He was a Roman proconsul, uh, deputy of Achaia, when Paul was at Corinth around AD 53. So now we get a little bit of of a chronology, if you will. Under the Emperor Claudius, Claudius Caesar, by the way, just like we say President Trump, Claudius Caesar, or no longer President Trump, President, I can't even utter his name, <laughs> Mr. Biden, I'm just gonna say Mr. Biden, there you go, I'm, I'm, I'm a little biased against that fellow there, even though I'm gonna pray for him, I just, he's a, he's a wicked, wicked man with his political decision making, I, I've given up Two weeks ago, I'm going good. I'm not, I'm not giving in the news. I'm not giving in all that silliness. <laughs> I listen to some conservative people make fun of it, but I'm, I'm, there's nothing biblical or holy about what's taking place here, so I'm not surprised. Let's just keep preaching Jesus. All right, so this fellow Galia was the brother of El Anius Seneca, the philosopher. So this fellow here was uh, of renown at the time. He was adopted into the family and so took the name of the rhetorician uh, Gallus, his birth name was Marcus Aeneas Novatus. He left Achaia when he began in a fever, often exclaiming that it was not his body but the place that had the disease. <laughs> you can see all those history uh, notes here. Quote, No mortal was ever so sweet to one as Galio was to all, says his brother, adding that, quote, There is none who does not love Galio a little, even if he cannot love him more. Quote, There is such an amount of innate good in him without any savor of art or dissimulation a person proof against plotting. So history, again, people are saying he was a good guy. But we'll see what's going on. How exactly and undes uh, undesignedly this independent testimony coincides with Acts 18. Here the Jews plotted to destroy Paul by bringing him before Galileo's judgment seat, but he was not to be entrapped into persecuting Christians by the Jews' spiteful maneuver. Because he's going to, and we'll read it right now, but uh, the, uh, the Fossa Dictionary here, they quote the verse, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, said he without waiting even to hear Paul's defense, just as the apostle was about to open his mouth. Reason well that I should bear with you, but since it is a question of word and names, and your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. Now the, the dictionary authors are putting this, you know, as a paraphrase, you Greeks, or if it has to do with Jesus, whatever. And so we drove them from the judgment seat. So the Greeks, sympathizing with the deputies, disgust at the Jews' intolerance, Beat Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the Jews' synagogue, before the judgment seat, and Galileo winked at it as a Jewish persecutor was only getting himself what he had intended for Paul. Thus God fulfilled his promise, Acts 18.10, Be not afraid, for speak, I am with thee, no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. Okay, Paul wasn't whooped <laughs> because of this man that said, I'm going to listen to you, Jews. You guys are tripping on your own little interpretation of your laws. I'm out of here get out of my office or get out of my judgment area. Jesus promised his word. Amen, Paul. He didn't get whooped. Praise the Lord. So I'm just, man, God can use anybody. I'm just telling you. Praise the Lord. Even a, even a, a fellow like this. Now, Galileo cared for none of these things. Does not mean he was careless about the thirst of God and that probably he was from his easy Epicurean-like temper, but with characteristic indifference to an outbreak provoked by the spite of the Jews, uh, he took no notice of the assault. Sosthenes himself seems, by Paul's sympathy and trouble, to have been one to Christ like Crispus. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Later, Sennacherib's ex execution by Nero made Galileo trembling, suppliant for his own life. You can read the history there. So his brother, Seneca, whoever he was, the philosopher, Nero took him out, killed him. So now Galileo became fearful of his own life. Jerome says he committed suicide in around A.D. 65. Seneca dedicated to him his treatise on anger and on a happy life. The accuracy of scripture appears on the title proconsul for Achaia was made a senatorial province and so on and so forth. So sadly, uh, either A, he committed suicide according to this history book, but in others, uh, you'll see that he was actually ordered to be taken out by Nero himself. I want to show you now from the uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia uh, later on down here, uh, let me show you where I found that note there. Um, 
if I can find uh, where it says that he was probably taken out. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where it was. But it, I, I was reading a couple of these dictionaries, um, studying a little bit more about Galileo and how he was taken out by Nero, uh, sadly. Let me see if I can find it in this one. Give me one more second here. Um, which one else did I look at here? I don't know if, Mac oh, it's because I don't have the other dictionary on. Let me see here if I can find it in this dictionary uh, as, as it pertains to what happened towards the end of this fellow's life by what we have recorded here in history. Yeah, I'm not seeing here. <clears throat> um, yeah, so there, yeah, I think, yeah, so, oh, never mind. I just read Fawcett, yeah, so he, Fawcett says that he took his own life. Um, but I think it was in another study book. I don't have it on here. It was in the McClon the McClontic study um dictionary that uh, actually had another perspective. Let me see if I can just find it here before we move on as it pertains to that. Uh, let's see here. Do I find it here? Can I just quickly skim read? Let's see here. Ah, here it is. So look. <clears throat> According to Eusebius, he committed suicide before the death of Seneca. But Tacitus speaks of him as alive after the event and Dion Cassius states that he was put to death by order of Nero. That's pretty crazy. So whether he killed himself or he was taken out, sadly, this judge was used by God for a little split second in time to what? Make sure Paul doesn't get hurt. <laughs> so that's pretty crazy uh, when you guys study out your history. So that, that's quite amazing there. So here's what happened. The Jews are at Corinth. They made insurrection i know that's a hot topic word right now ironically for those of you who live in the united states we have a former president who is being wrongly accused of something he did not do and sadly many folks that uh, uh that trust the media as their god are being dis uh, sadly um beguiled i would say from the powers that be let me give you the definition here for the word insurrection Webster's 1828, insurrection here is a rising against civil or political authority. The open and active opposition of a number of persons to the execution of a law in a city or state. It is equivalent to sedition, except that sedition expresses a less extensive rising of citizens. It differs from rebellion, for the latter expresses a revolt or an attempt to overthrow the government, to establish a different one or to place the country under another jurisdiction. It differs from mutiny as it respects the civil or political government, whereas mutiny is an open opposition to law in the army or navy. Insurrection is, however, used with such latitude as to comprehend either sedition or rebellion. In other words, an insurrection is a rising in mass to oppose an enemy or political authority. So what happened there? If you can, with me, in, in, in the imagination of your mind here, in, in, a, in a Corinth, these Jews to whom Paul preached, they all got together and they wanted to bring Paul to Galileo because he was the deputy of Achaia. And obviously he was dwelling there in Corinth where his political office was and, and it just goes to show that Jesus' words were right that the times of the Gentiles are fulfilling themselves. That is that the Gentiles have superior political power over the Jews so they have to go to them for anything. So they brought him to the judgment seat saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. When Paul was now about to open his mouth, he was about to give an offense. Galileo said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O you Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. Now what about that? Here are Jews coming before a Roman Gentile who has political power and authority. He is well versed in Roman law. And perhaps he's familiar with Jewish law. But here is a separation of his jurisdiction. He does not want to get involved with the Jewish affairs as it pertains to the practice of their religion, of interpretation, etc. <laughs> Ironically, I wish today that the United States would follow the example of Galileo that they will not get involved with the churches and tell them what about this and what about that. And uh, that's just one thing I want to do, I, I, although I know, ironically, in text, it's, it's actually a religious group trying to use the government to do something on their behalf, which is obviously take Paul out. But look at, he says, 
if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that Romans chapter 1 is right, that God has given unto every man the knowledge of himself. Every man within their conscience have an understanding. Romans 2, they have the law written in their hearts. They know between good and evil. So here we have a Gentile man, ironically, exposing the fallacies of these Jews for their envy. He hasn't done nothing wrong or wicked, or else I do something about it, but because it has nothing to do with a man's character, if you will, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to listen to what you guys are going to say for lack of better terms. If it's a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. But remember, Jesus says, no man's going to hurt you. So God can use people like this to help his people. So just make that an encouragement, perhaps folks out there, you never know. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Get up on out of here. <laughs> that was just Brother Carlos' commentary, by the way. Verse 17, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Galileo cared for none of these things. Now, here's what's amazing about this fellow Sosthenes. I'm going to give you two perspectives as to the general view. First of all, in your King James Bible, the word Sosthenes appears two times. The first here in Acts 18, 17, and then... We get one more in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. The scripture says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Where a lot of the people are differing happens to be in the case of Sosthenes. And the reason that is, is because a lot of folks are saying, perhaps this Sosthenes at the first was actually one of the Jews that made insurrection against Paul. Because prior to that, we don't see him acknowledged by Luke as a brother. But at some point thereafter, this if it's the same Sosthenes, you got to remember, people had the same name back in these days. It could have been the same. We don't know. History, history uh, hasn't been uh, detailed, and we'll find out one day in God's heaven if, if that was the Sosthenes that got beaten. But here, let me give you a couple of views. From the Fawcett's Bible Dictionary, uh, here he was acknowledged as a ruler of the synagogue. You guys remember what Luke said there in Acts 18. And this is what the dictionary says, after Crispus on conversion had ceased to be so. Because prior in Acts 18, when you guys go back there, Crispus was the chief ruler. Let me show you that quickly for those of you guys who are following along with me on the projector. Let's go back quickly to Acts 18. Hopefully you are there with me. Go back with me here to verse number 8. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue. Do you see that? So what a lot of the, the historians are saying is, well, Crispus got saved. He was one of the Jews that believed. One of the Jews that didn't, Sosthenes, perhaps he succeeded that position because so many needed to rule the synagogue faithfully against the Christian ways. So again, history, they're just trying to say that perhaps it is this Sosthenes in verse number um, 17 that became the chief ruler, you see, of the synagogue. So let's go back to our dictionary. <clears throat> Probably the ringleader of the spiteful Jews with one accord made insurrection against Paul and brought him to Galileo's judgment seat. When Galileo would not be made the tool of their spite, but drove them from his judgment seat, the Greeks, or Gentiles, seeing the deputies feeling wish... Uh, which they sympathized with against the Jewish bigots, seized Sosthenes and beat him before Galileo's judgment seat. Galileo cared for none of these things. That is, he refused to interfere, being secretly pleased that the mob should second his own content for the fanatical Jews. These are just, this is just a dictionary. But in 1 Corinthians 1, 1, we find Sosthenes under very different circumstances, no longer against Paul, if that's the case that he was initially, but associated with him in saluting the Corinthian Christians. When arose the change? I like this dictionary uh, definition. Paul probably showed Christian sympathy for an adversary in distress. Now, now stick with it. The issue was the conversion of Sosthenes. You see, Saul the persecutor turned into Paul the apostle, and Sosthenes, the ringleader of persecution against the apostle, were two trophies of grace that side by side would appeal with double power to the church at Corinth. Paul designates in 1 Corinthians 1, our brother, Sosthenes. In a way implying that Sosthenes was well known to the Corinthians, though at the time of writing he must have been 
with Paul at Ephesus. One more. <clears throat> Again, this is just the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. They just give you some notes there. McClintock. Again, a lot of these dictionary historians are all in agreement of that principle that he probably was against um, Paul initially. He was probably the leader of the crowd. And, uh, and uh, afterwards, perhaps his conversion took place. And as you can read here in the notes, I'm not going to read them all there, but you can see here perhaps that was him. Let me give you what I think. Let's go back to Acts 18 and see what happened. The Gentile deputy just said, I don't want to listen to anything you guys have to say. I don't want to be part of it. But who, who, who made the insurrection? The Jews. <laughs> A lot of Jews just charged the political office and said, we want you to judge this guy. They interrupted his life. They, what, who knows what the deputy was doing, you know, just being a Roman and a celebrity of the time, if you will. He's a man of high power. He's a man of authority. He just come into his office like that, making a ruckus. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Get out of here. He drove them out. Go down to verse number 16. Then all the Greeks, where do they, where do they come from? Well, they were there at the judgment seat. <laughs> These Greeks were right there, and perhaps that's why a lot of the historians think, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm partly agreeing with them, that's why they went specifically for Sosinus, because perhaps it was Sosinus who was the vocalizer to, the, um, to Galileo. Because look at what it says. Here in uh, 12, the Jews made insurrection, saying, it doesn't give us who. The Holy Spirit didn't put def def definitively Sosinus as a representative head of the crowd, if you will, the leader of the pack. But scripture with scripture, in principle, using logic, I think it's safe to say that out of all those Jews, because it's an insurrection, you have a ton of dudes going in there. Why did they go after this guy, <laughs> Sosinus? Perhaps he was the vocalizer. I'm, I'm just giving you what I think, and that's all right if you differ. So regardless, these Gentiles took Sosinus, the Jew, and they whooped that fool. <laughs> they beat him up right there. Stay with me. Jesus just came to Paul by night, did he not? Don't worry, Paul. Speak. No man's going to hurt you. Here's the Jews rebelling against their God, refusing to be saved, refusing their Messiah. Okay, here's a judgment. Here's the judgment. But watch this. Verse 17. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. Who was there witnessing Sosinus being beaten? Paul. Hmm. How would this Sosinus character, if it's the same, become a brother later on? Perhaps by the love of Jesus and Paul. Let me take you, before we close, to two more places. Let's turn our Bibles together to the book of Romans, chapter 12, which ironically is going to be coming up in our Sunday services. Let me give you a little, a little sneak peek for those of you who are here this evening. Brother Manny already sowed a seed with those tamales. Praise the Lord. Romans 12. This is why the grace of God abounds the more where sin abounds. This is why even in the face of persecution, either you witnessing it or it's being, a, it's being brought against you, if you remain faithful as somebody desirous for souls, people can get saved even to the uttermost. A guy who was just coming against you, leading a crowd, he ends up getting beat. All the Jews probably left, and he's right there just crying and weeping, bloodied up. But here comes that apostle, Paul. Let me give you this. Romans 12, 12. He says, this is Paul. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. 
Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, watch this church. If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's my defense for why I think Paul led Sosinus to saving faith. Because here's his enemy. He just made an insurrection with all these Jews. He brought them to the governor, to the deputy. Take this man out because he is disrespecting our religion. He's making another means to worship our God. The Roman Gentile says, I don't want to have anything to do with that interpretation. Get out of my political office. You wasted our, the proconsul's time. They beat on Sosinus. All those Jews flee. And while he's there, Paul is remembering the Lord's dealing with him. You know who he was? He was that persecutor. He was a Sosinus before. He brought Christians to prison, just like Sosinus was trying to do for him. But you know what the Lord said? Paul, if he's hungry, I want you to go over there and feed him. He just, he just cursed you out. I want you to go over there and bless him. As a matter of fact, Paul, I want you to pray for him. I want you to let him know what I did for him on that cross because of how good I've been to you. Are you with me? One more. For those of you thinking I'm getting emotional, this is just my throat, by the way. I don't know what's going on. I need to drink some water. <laughs> but the Bible is good, amen. If you feel like crying, that's okay. 1 Corinthians 13. This is why I take the perspective that Paul perhaps did lead Sosinus to Christ because of the love of Jesus that he followed through in the face of persecution. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and let's read together in our closing verses, verse number four. For many of you who, f who ask at times, thank you. Well, brother, I, how can I be so kind to somebody who treats me so bad? How can I, how do you expect me to forgive and to do all that godly Christian-like love and principle to people who offend me, people who hurt me, backstab me? You're right. Those are valid questions. But when you come back to the place of humility, that you were a sinner who offended a holy God, and he was going to send you to hell, it doesn't matter how many tears you've shed because of this and that on this earth, you offended him. And yet he was willing to crucify his son for you. He was willing to beat his son for you. And he was willing to put the punishment of your sin upon his son for you. He had no sin in himself to be punished of, but all that to show you forgiveness is possible. This is the virtue of the Spirit of God in believers. 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity suffereth long. It's patient. Is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not... Are you ready? How many of you guys say you're spiritual-led? Spirit-led? Not easily provoked thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So now, just, just think with me now. He just got beat down, Sosinus did, for a free will intention. He thought he was doing something right for God. <laughs> but Jesus told Paul, don't be afraid I'm with you, go and speak to turn their eyes from darkness to light, faith in me. And after everybody left Sosinus because them Jews fled, here he is. All right, what did the Holy Spirit impress upon Paul and given him understanding of being a Christian? I'm not gonna, re I'm not gonna revenge this man. I'm not gonna be joyful in his beating because charity, what does it say? It's not easy, easily provoked. It doesn't think evil. He's not going to respond the way he responded. You know what? Let me go over there to Sosinus. Let me help him out. Let me give him a hand. Let me wipe his wounds. Let me bless him. Get him some food. Help him make sure he gets back safe. The fellow just got whooped on, man. And it's pretty, and 
perhaps most likely, that's how he got saved, by the love of Jesus through this one man, Paul, who was willing to be a faithful ambassador. So I don't know who you are this evening. For those of you watching online or those of you in-house, as you keep winning souls and you keep doing your best for Jesus, sometimes you get provoked, sometimes people persecute you, say mean things to you on the streets, but don't give up on them. Just a little bit more patience. You never know what Jesus can do through you. Perhaps that's what's going to prick their heart and get saved by your kindness. Don't forget to be a kind Christian. Don't forget to be a charitable Christian. Yes, I know we go down and street preach. Yes, I know we, we come out in different ways. But what people need to know is that there is a, a loving God who's willing to be merciful to their wickedness. They need to see that charity in us, just like Samson saw in Paul. Amen? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the history that we've gained. And I just pray today, Lord, that we take the truths that we learned this evening, put them into practice within our lives. Help us to follow an example, just like Paul. Help us to be charitable. Help us to be peaceful. And even in a time of persecution, either by the government, family, friends, those who come against us for our faith, help us to remain faithful. Help us to bless them. Help us not to be provoked. Help us not to be selfish. Help us not to think of feelings and self when we're trying to deal with that, but help us to love them through your eyes. We love you and we thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, the Lord bless you. Thanks for coming. Lord willing, we'll see you guys next Friday for Friday night discipleship class here this evening. For those of you watching online, you want to ask a question, feel free to direct message me, put a comment, and we'll do our best to answer your questions for Friday night discipleship. God bless you.